appreciate it. Grab your Bibles if you do, uh, have them with you or your device, and go to Matthew 24, if you would please. Matthew 24. Father, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you that you are um, on the throne. I know, Lord, there are things going around a lot of people in this year. They're dismissing people's concerns, saying, oh, God's in control. But, Lord, we understand this, that while you're on the throne, you have given the keys of the kingdom to your people. And Lord, we don't want to have, um, Lord, just a, a, a naive sense of, oh, well, I'll just sit back and wait and see what God does. Lord, you have put the authority of heaven in the hands and the lives of your church and your people. God, forgive us for being spectators. Sometimes in the midst of this year, Lord, we've had an attitude of, of Lord, just help me survive. And we understand that we go through those times. But God, may there be a radical shift in the way that we approach life. Lord, that we would understand you have empowered your people to be the agents of change in the earth today. So Lord, forgive us for waiting for the CDC or, or Washington, D.C. or anyone else to set the tone for the future. God, we pray for all of these institutions and the places of culture that need the infusion of the kingdom of God. But Lord, we will not cede our authority to Washington, to the CDC, to any other group or people. We are the expression of Jesus on earth. And that comes by the authority of your name, your word, and your spirit. So God, may you release an infusion and an empowering of your spirit to a dimension and level that we have not yet walked in so that we will be, be, be prepared and equipped for the days ahead. And Lord, we pray that in the midst of all of this, the name of Jesus will be glorified and lifted up in all the earth as never before. And Lord, we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. You know, a lot of things have been going on in uh, this last year, and there's been a lot of talk about the last days, the end times. Now, for those of you that aren't uh, you know, millennials or Gen X, some of us that have been around a little while, we remember that nearly every time something is going wrong in culture, there's a lot of talk about the last days and the end times. Anybody remember that? In the uh, 1970s, growing up, I was born in 63, I'm 57 years old, and I remember, especially in the 1970s, as a teenager, especially in uh, a lot of the Pentecostal charismatic churches, there was a lot of talk about the end times. We'd just come out of the Vietnam War, um, we had a cultural revolution from the 60s and into the early mid-70s, and there was a lot of talk because we saw our culture in America becoming less and less godly, less and less, less, and less uh, honoring of the word of God and, the, and Jesus. And so there was a lot of turmoil in the lives of the church. And so in the midst of that, there was a lot of talk and preaching about the end times. And so a book was written by a man named Hal Lindsey. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody remember that book? And uh, Billy Graham's ministry released some, some uh, movies called Thief in the Night. So there was a lot of talk about the end times. And so I remember as a kid growing up, I don't know if any of you can identify with this, and coming home from school and you couldn't find mom and you thought you'd miss the rapture. <laughs> you know, you're running around repenting. Um, I, when I was nine years old, this is 1972, I was nine years old, um, I went to a Baptist kids camp. And whoever set this campground up, they just weren't right in the head. They put the boys' dorms over here, and right over here were the bathrooms and showers, and right in the middle was a graveyard. So I want you to imagine this. In the middle of the night, if we had to go to the bathroom, we had to walk through a cemetery. <laughs> Our counselor, though, was even worse. His devotion to us every night before we went to bed was out of the book of Revelation. So he had a group of eight, nine, ten-year-old boys, <laughs> excuse me, and before bed, he's reading to us about the Antichrist of 666 and getting your head cut off and all this stuff. And, and so one night, he decided he would play a joke on us. After reading to us about Revelation, he turned off the light, and as he walked out of our room, he said, Good night. He waited about ten minutes. He snuck around to the window next to our bunk beds, started banging on the window, screaming bloody murder. We thought the Antichrist had come to get us. We didn't need the bathrooms that night, if you get my drift. <laughs> it scared something out of us. But so growing up, I remember 
everything about the end times was all about the Antichrist and fear and, and God would rescue us out of here before things got too bad. And then we come into the 1980s and there was a measure of a return to godliness as a culture. There were some moves of God. And then to the late 80s when we were uh, coming into uh, right before communism began to fall and the beginning of all of that, there was a man who wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Was Come Back in 1988. Anybody remember that? And when it didn't happen in the date September whatever of 88, he said, oops, I missed it a year and wrote another book. Sold it, of course, you know, money. And um, said 89 reasons why Jesus was coming back in 89. We're, we're still here. I don't think we missed the rapture, right? Well, you know, you, you advance on a little bit. In the, the mid-1990s, there was a fresh move of God. It was called the Toronto Blessing, the Pensacola Outpouring, fresh moves of God. But I remember in uh, September of 2001, uh, Kim was eight months pregnant. We were in Vancouver, Canada, ministering. And I was going out every morning from our hotel, and I was jogging a few miles, and my jogging path took me by the airport. And so as I'm jogging, I notice there's no air traffic going on. I don't know what's going on. I get back to our, our hotel room. Kim's sitting on the bed crying with a television on, and we watch as America is attacked on 9-11. And, you know, I actually, actually just back, back, uh, backtrack about a year, year and a half from that. And we were coming into the year 2000. The year 2000 seemed like it was some magical year that we were going to see, you know, either space age jets and stuff or, or God was going to come in glory and power or something would happen. And there was a lot of talk about Y2K. Remember? And there was a lot of fear based around that. And Jesus is coming back in the year 2000 and these kinds of things. 2001, all this is going on, we're attacked, and all of a sudden our churches in our nation are filled with people that are fearful, and so they turn to God for a moment of time. I remember going through a sense of, God, my ministry is not accomplishing anything. Here I am, standing up and preaching and praying and prophesying, and yet nothing I do has changed what happened in our nation. And I had to walk through learning about these different things. But when the immediate fear of 2001 uh, went away, it's like America didn't just return to where it had been. We have been on a path running as fast as we can as a nation away from anything biblical or godly. And what I find is this, and I'm, we can talk about mankind, and we've been all over the world, I've watched this. But let me say this, to the American church, we're weak and wimpy and cowards by and large. We are so blessed that we become lazy. Do you know in Ezekiel, it talks about the sins of Sodom. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And there's a lot of talk about the sin of Sodom, homosexuality, and all that has to do with gender confusion, and the deception, and the sin, and the lies that our culture is believing, all that. And I better be careful. In a few months, I might get arrested for saying that. But, do you know Ezekiel tells us what the sin of Sodom was. The sin of Sodom primarily was not homosexuality. It was this. Ezekiel, I think it's around somewhere in chapter 16, says the sin of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. In other words, they were proud, fat, and lazy. You know what? You want to know the sin that America will be judged for? Proud, fat, and lazy Christians. And because the church is weak and cowardly and wimpy, you see, as we travel around the world, I've been in places where people are killed for serving Jesus. I don't like masks. I think it's okay to wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, deal with it, you know, and, and do what you need to do. I don't think it started out as religious persecution. I do think there are some state governments that have tried to go beyond just safety and try to use it. We see when the American church weeps and cries, oh, they're persecuting us because they want you to wear a mask. Much of the world would, would, would think you've lost your mind because they are dying for the cause of Christ. You see, we have a church in America that's been so over-pastored. Thank God for pastors. But pastors, by and large, shield us, protect us, they nurture us, 
and we've been so nurtured on a bottle of spiritual milk that we are still babies when we need to be mature. Instead of children needing somebody to hold our hand to survive 2020, we ought to be warriors ready to take on the enemy. But that's not, by and large, where the church in America has been. But God is raising up a remnant of his people in this day. And so, all the talk about the end times. You know, when everything first started coming, you know, uh, have you seen the things going around that Bill Gates is supposedly the Antichrist? Or maybe if you get the vaccine, you're going to accidentally take the mark of the beast. Can I tell you something? Whether you're pro-vax or anti-vax, you're not going to accidentally get the mark of the beast. I have a lot of opinions about what's going on in health, in politics, and all these other things. But here's what I found. The kingdom of God and the word of God is above all of that. And God is teaching us as his people that we are to bring the influence of his kingdom into culture, but we don't base our hope and our future on culture, but on Christ. And so the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 24, and they began to ask him about the signs of the end of time. That's what a lot of people are doing in 2020 and 2021. What are the signs of the end of time? Is it because of, of a virus? Whether, uh, ex whether um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? We know it's real, but whether the fear is founded or unfounded, whether the powers that be, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, are trying to use every crisis they can to increase their hold and bring communism, socialism, and destruction and persecution to the people of America. I believe that, yes. But what are the signs of the end? And Jesus goes on to begin to talk to them. And he said, uh, he, the disciples said, tell us, when will these things happen, the end of time, the signs of your coming, and the end of the age? Be? Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Let me stop there for a moment. By and large, people are not going around saying, hi, I'm Jesus Christ, follow me. Correct? But when it says there will be many false Christs, the word Christ is not the name of Jesus. It's his description. Christ means the anointed one. There are many crying out, I have the anointing or I have the power or I have the answer for your future. Spiritually, politically, economically. And God is saying to us here and warning us, don't follow someone just because they say I have the answer. Don't follow governmental leaders just because they say, I have the answer and I'll pay your bills for you whether you work or not. Don't follow somebody just because they say they have the answer. We live in a day where everybody's an expert because they have a Facebook page. Don't believe somebody just because they say they're an expert. One of the greatest things the church needs in these days is going to be discernment because who knows what's, who knows what's true anymore? Well, he's true. His word is true in the midst of all of this other stuff. It says, there will be false Christs that deceive many. You hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it you are not alarmed. In other words, don't become fearful. Don't get alarmed. Be at peace in the midst of the storm. It says, such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Do you know the word there, nation, in Greek is ethnos? Do you know what God, Jesus is saying? One of the signs at the end of time is going to be ethnic group will arise against ethnic group. Look at me. This has been going on since the beginning of time. Just because we're walking through some ethnic issues in our nation doesn't mean that this is harder or worse than it's ever been before in history. People have always been afraid and fearful and full of hate from people that are different. But one of the greatest things that's going to show the world that we are his people is our love one for another. That means we may disagree. Kim and I have been married almost 37 years, and she still doesn't think I'm right about everything. 
But guess what? We can be in unity even though we may have disagreement. Even sharp disagreement sometimes. Our unity as a body of Christ is not based and understand. I have very, very strong political opinions right now. But can I tell you, our unity is not based on who you voted for. Our unity is not based on these things. It's based on Christ. But it says, nation will rise against nation. Ethos against ethos. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these are just the beginning of birth pains. This has been going on for 2,000 years and beyond, and it's the beginning of birth pains. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I don't think just because we had 2020 that it means Jesus is coming tomorrow. We need to live ready for his coming, but we also need to live as if we have 100 years so that we will bring the kingdom of God to bear in our culture and our people and our nation. Then you will be handed over. They'll be persecuted and put to death. If you're a crybaby about having to wear a mask, you got to get yourself ready. Because it says you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. I'm going to give a little opinion here. And you can throw it out because this is opinion if you desire. But it says there are many, many false prophets that will come. I love the prophetic ministry. I love the move of the Spirit of God. But do not base your life on what some internet prophet prophesies for the coming year. I believe and I test what God has said. But there's been a lot of disrepute brought to the prophetic ministry in this last year. Because the people that prophesied it would be a two-week thing and then over. It would be gone a Passover and then it wasn't. And then it was going to be gone a Pentecost and then it wasn't. And then people that prophesied certain outcomes to elections and it doesn't yet appear that it's going to be that way. That we all know things are in flux right now in that. I'm not trying to throw stones at anybody and call them a false prophet. But the body of Christ is right now being led by a schizophrenic spirit masquerading as the prophetic. Because a lot of people are prophesying their politics and their eschatology or end time theology and not listening to the Spirit of God. The body says when it comes to the word says when it comes to the prophetic, let the prophet speak by two or three and the others judge. It's time the prophetic people quit using their Facebook page as a platform for their part of the puzzle. And we have a word that is consent of all of us together hearing the word of the Lord. Because you have part and I have part. And so don't be swayed just because your favorite prophet didn't get a prophecy right. And understand this. There will be false prophets or will be the spirit of the false prophet. Do you know that one day there's going to be an actual false prophet working with the Antichrist to bring deception? Be careful. Because right now, media and social media, I believe, are doing the work of a false prophet spirit. I'm not calling him the false prophet. But right now, people are so inundated with information, they don't know what to believe. And so they believe sources they've leaned on and trusted for years. Don't believe something just because it's on the Internet. Don't believe something just because some mainstream media talking head says it. Be aware because there will be false Christs and false prophets all around. Deceive many because of the increase of wickedness. How many would agree wickedness is increasing? Whether you agree or not with the incoming administration, they're already, uh, they're at least uh, appearing, uh, uh, incoming administration, they're already appointing homosexuals and possibly transgenders to national offices. They're already wanting to undo our uh, restrictions on abortion. Guys, we are entering into a season, if we don't have an awakening in this nation, of wickedness being celebrated and pushed on us beyond everything we've seen. It says, beware, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. You see, when you no longer are applauded and, and celebrated for standing for righteousness, but you're persecuted, we're going to see who the true followers of Christ are. These are signs of the end of time. But I want to come down and say there's one thing I look for more than anything else. In Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus said, and here's the sign of the end approaching. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, all ethnicities. And then 
the end will come. I don't care how bad it gets around us. I don't care how, dis, uh, how, how many diseases or famine or earthquake or wars. The end is not yet until the gospel of the kingdom of God has swept the earth. We are not called to sit back. Look, and if, look I've got a gun. I've got a knife. I've got a stun gun. We've got pepper spray. <laughs> I'm ready. Of course, we've got a drug house across the street from us. But I'm ready. But I'm not a prepper. I'm not going to shoot you unless I have to. Get, get, get forgiveness later, right? Some of you think I'm, I'm of hell now, aren't you? Look, your faith cannot be in your gun store, your gold, your Bitcoin, your food store. Our trust and our faith have to be in Christ and what he's doing. And so I don't care how bad it gets around us. We must take the gospel of the kingdom of God to all the nations, and then the end will come. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? I mean, we have had churches on every corner of our nation for years, for decades. We have mega churches. We have Christian TV, Christian radio, Christian internet. And yet, in the midst of all of these things, our nation has been going further and further away from God. We're losing in a generation because they're not seeing Christ. They're seeing church. They're seeing religion. When we bring Jesus to the masses in love, in reality, in truth, and in power, then they will encounter Christ. And they will be transformed. And when one individual is transformed, they will then bring the influence of Christ to transform whole swaths of society. Look, Washington, D.C. can't get saved. The government can't get saved, but leaders can get saved and start bringing the influence of Christ into government, into politics, into all of these things. How do we do the work of the kingdom of God? How do we get the expression of Jesus to all the earth? Zechariah 4, 6 says this, it's not by might nor by power, but how? By the Spirit of the Lord. You see, Jesus, when he had given the disciples the great commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation, make disciples of all nations. He said, and don't go, don't do this until I empower you with a spirit from on high to be able to accomplish this. He said, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, until you're filled, until you're empowered with the Holy Spirit. I want to declare that one of the greatest tools and weapons for the future is the empowering of the Holy Spirit in the church. That means we need a fresh Pentecost. We need a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit of God. In Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 2, we're told of the 500 people that Jesus appeared to after his, um, his resurrection. Only 120 of those 500 actually made it to the upper room. But as they got to the upper room and they began to pray and seek the face of God, it says suddenly there was a sound from heaven. Please understand, no matter how dark it gets, there is a suddenly of God on the horizon. When we don't see any way forward, when people are getting sick around us, we've had friends and family members die from the virus ourselves. When we see these things going on, when you don't know and you're fearful about the future, please. God is saying the hope and faith is wait on my spirit and I will empower you. So they came together, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, and it said it filled the whole house where they were sitting. You know what? God's not going to be a respecter of persons when it comes to pouring his spirit out. God's going to pour his spirit out on whoever is asking, whoever's seeking, whoever's waiting, whoever is hungry. As long as they're born again, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity, it doesn't matter what your color, it doesn't matter what your background or your denomination. One of our prophetic mentors said this years ago, he said, if you will quit fighting denominations, I will give you nations. This is not about just denominational differences, but every difference we find in the body of Christ. Because that one day in, in the future, in eternity, we're going to have people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. They're going to be people that don't look like you. 
They don't smell like you. They don't talk like you. And yet they're going to be around the throne worshiping God in eternity. That means I need to learn how to live in that kind of unity of the spirit. But you know what I found? I found that kind of unity is not possible except for the Holy Spirit. Let me say something, and I hope you receive what I'm about to say. I'm a 57-year-old, white, middle-class, straight man in America. Probably the most hated demographic right now. Because I'm white, I'm middle-class, I'm male, and I'm straight. That's not politically correct. But how many of you think that some of my opinions, some of my politics, probably have been influenced by my race and my age? That's okay. I don't know what it means to be a 19, 20, whatever you old, you're black man or black woman in America. I don't know what it means. We need to have those kind of conversations. Would you agree? But let me say this. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what a black man thinks or a white man thinks. It matters what God thinks. Are you able to receive what I'm saying? We need to hear one another. But at the end of the day, your opinion and my opinion don't count. Only God's opinion counts. True unity is not based around me tearing down statues to make you feel comfortable. Unity is not based around me hating the police. Unity is not based around a politician. Unity is based around Jesus. And when we get in that kind of unity, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. And when the Holy Spirit came, there were three key manifestations. First, there was a sound of a blowing, violent wind. You see, many times we want the gentle breeze of Jesus. Oh, come, mighty God. Breathe on me. I love it when God breathes on us. But sometimes we need a violent wind to upset the status quo of our life. How many of you have found your life has been violently <laughs> upended in this last year? I'm not saying this wind of last year is from God, but God can send a wind that can blow away the enemy. But it will revolutionize our lives. And when the wind of the Spirit comes, he breathes life. Do you remember the story in Ezekiel chapter 37? Ezekiel the prophet is taken by God to a valley of dry bones. And I want to say this. God is bringing forth a generation of prophets that are not looking for a platform and applause and a mailing list. But God's going to send them to the graveyards of our culture. God, give us men and women full of the spirit of prophecy that are not looking for a following or a microphone, but they're willing to go to the very graveyards of our nation and prophesy life. And as Ezekiel began to prophesy to a graveyard, even God said to him, can these bones live? You know what Ezekiel said? God, I don't know. Let me say this. Can America have an awakening? It can, but will it? I don't know. That's not a lack of faith. It's just the reality. I don't know what the future holds. You've heard it. I know who holds the future. Ezekiel, in the midst of doubt, prophesied to a graveyard and said, Bones, come alive. God's going to make breath into you. He's going to bring you to life. He's going to unify you and restore you. God desires not words of judgment. I hear my heart in this. When we sow to sin, we will reap the whirlwind. We will reap the results of sin. But you know what God's purpose is? God's desire is not to judge America. God's desire is to bless America. But God can't bless where there's sin and lack of repentance and pride. There must be a humbling. And you know what? If the church is not willing to humble themselves, God may have to humble the nation en masse. But I pray it doesn't have to happen that way. I pray that God will get a hold of our hearts where we willingly humble ourselves. And we serve the nation instead of trying to judge the nation. I'm not against words of judgment when it's a warning of God to call us back to repentance. But God's heart is not to judge, it's to bless. So Ezekiel, when he stood in front of the Valley of Dry Bones, he didn't beat them up for being dead. He gave them hope. 
God is giving hope to our nation and hope to his church and saying, if you will allow me, my breath will breathe on you. And so as his eagle prophesied, so there, was a, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together bone to bone. Now we Pentecostals will be satisfied with a little noise, right? Have a little noise and bless God, we're having revival. But you know what? The bones, when they moved, there was noise, but they were still dead. Sometimes in the Pentecostal world, we get excited about a prophecy, a prayer meeting, a worship service, a sermon, but we don't follow through until it's fully realized in our lives. We go from one spiritual or emotional high to the next. God is asking you and I to grow up beyond the need for another emotional fix. I love the moves of God. I love when God touches our emotions. But part of the reason the church in America is so infantile is because we have not taken the meat and the hardness of a good soldier, Jesus Christ, and we just wanted to go from one spiritual high to the next. God's going to move. He's going to bring the bones together. That's unity. He's going to put flesh and muscle on the bones. That's the word of God, which is our muscle, and that's our love covering one another, protecting one another through the blood of Christ. But in the midst of that, Ezekiel didn't stop. He prophesied one more time, not to the bones, but to the very presence of God, and said, come, ruach, breath of God, and breathe on these slain that they may live. God is releasing a dimension of prophetic anointing that's not just prophesying individual promises to people. It is speaking, and this is what I hope you do in these next days of prayer, that you will prophesy into the heavenly realm and say, breath of God, breathe on our nation again. Breath of God, breathe on your church again and bring us out of our spiritual graves. And when they arose in Ezekiel 37, they arose as an army. Guys, it's time that we, the sheep of his pasture, put on the armor of God and actually begin to fight the battle. I read a day or two ago, somebody said they felt that 2021 was the year of Ephesians chapter 6, where it says, put on the whole armor of God. Look, we all need somebody to pat us on the back when we're discouraged. Somebody to hold our hand when we're walking through the fire. Pastor read us out of Isaiah. The fire will not kindle upon you. The waters will not overwhelm you. We need that kind of encouragement. But there comes a time when we've got to go past just needing another pat on the back. And we arise. And we get trained. And then we get kicked in the rear end until we get into battle. So there's a wind of the Spirit of God that comes with the outpouring of the Spirit. Number two, it says, there was a fire that came from heaven and separated and rested upon each of them. The fire of God is being released in a fresh way in the church. What does fire mean? Number one, it means passion. God is releasing a fresh passion in the church. We're not going to love church. We're not going to love miracles. We're not going to love worship services. We're going to love Jesus. All these other things are good, but our passion is not going to be the move of God, but God himself. We're going to fall in love with him over again. He's going to woo us. You know, um, it, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'll probably embarrass her. She kind of is 19. And it's interesting watching guys in different parts of the world, you know, they try to, you know, woo her or try to flirt or try to whatever it is. Of course, we don't believe in flirting anymore now that we're parents. Um, you know, but... And, and, and watch this. Do you know what? God wants to woo you into his heart. He wants to draw you. You see, Jesus loves you with an undying, un, uh, undying un, unending love. And he deserves a love that's more than a lukewarm, passionless, self-focused love back to him. He deserves a fiery passion in love. And so God wants to stir in us that heart. Back in, in, in uh, college in the 1980s, I went to college with a, a, a Puerto Rican evangelist, Angel Barrios, and uh, Angel. And anybody remember back in the 80s, early 90s, there was a, there was a song called Rico Suave. Well, this guy was the embodiment of Rico Suave. I mean, he had the clothes, he had the sports car, he had the skinny, narrow tie from the 80s. And I heard him on the phone one time with a girlfriend. And he was getting all Latin with her. He's like, oh, baby, you light my fire. I, mean, I thought it sounded like junior high school. But still, he was passionate. There needs to be a fresh passion awakened in the hearts of the people of God. 
where we love him and we're willing to endure anything, sacrifice anything for love. So there's a wind that brings us to life, but there's a fire that reawakens passion. Number two, the fire of God brings purity. I don't, I don't need to or have the time to try to enumerate all the things that God's doing and purifying the church. Look, there have been some high-profile revelations throughout the years of sin in high places, even in ministry. And I don't believe those revelations are over. We have had people that have followed and idolized men and, and giftings. And God's not going to share his glory with anyone. We're about to see revelation. And I pray, God, let the exposure happen in every segment of society. God, expose sin, expose fraud, expose deception in every sphere of society. And I believe it's going to happen. You see, we in the church, we hide away our pet sin, and we come to church and we put on the face. Some of us like the mask because we can hide behind them. But you see, God is looking for purity. How can we have authority against the spirit of perversion and deception and murder and all of these things in our culture if we give place to it in our own heart? So God is bringing us to the place of, of purity, of repentance. Repentance means to change. It doesn't mean to cry. You can cry. How many of you know that you can cry without changing? You know, Kevin kind of, we just came through Christmas. I don't know if any of you saw Hallmark Christmas movies. Kevin Shekinah can put on a Hallmark Christmas movie. You know, and the, you know, it's the same story. You know, a big town woman falls in love with a small town man. You know, all the other stuff. <laughs> and I do the typical man thing when they put on a Hallmark movie. I don't want to watch that. Five minutes later, I'm sitting there. <laughs> I can cry with the best of you, but that doesn't mean I've changed. It doesn't mean that I want to watch Hallmark. <laughs> all of it to say this. We know how to cry tears in the spiritual church. But tears are not enough. Repentance is change. I can cry or I can not cry, but it means tomorrow I'm going to live differently than I did yesterday. And there needs to be a fire of purity released again in the people of God. And then finally, fire also speaks of God propelling us into our future. Where Kim and Shekinah and I live in Hampton, Virginia, it's, uh, we have a NASA there. You know, Florida is where our spacecraft take off from. Houston is mission control. Hampton, Virginia, NASA is where they develop space propulsion for the next generation. In other words, we have friends that are rocket scientists. And if you've ever watched a spacecraft take off, there's a fire, a massive fire that's got a light to propel that rocket to get free of the pull of gravity. There's a fire of God being lit in the church to break us free of the pull of worldly thinking and worldly goals and worldly ways of doing things. And that fire will eventually propel that rocket into outer space of the heavenly realm. There is a fire of a spirit that is going to propel the church into realms of glory and realms of a spirit that we prayed for and not yet experienced. But let's wrap it all up. There was wind, there was fire. But what else happened? It says it began to speak in other tongues. Number one, the very ones who have been silent when Jesus was being beaten and crucified opened their mouths and began to speak. God is going to fill the mouths of the quietest of us. Those that feel you failed Christ by not standing up for the gospel. God is saying, that's the past. Now open your mouth and I'm going to fill it. We're not saying you have to change your personality. We're not saying you have to become a loud mouth preacher. What we are saying, though, is God has somebody that you can reach that nobody else can. Open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit fill it with the testimony of Jesus. Number two, when they began to speak in tongues, this was not a natural language. It was a supernatural work of the Spirit of God. 
In other words, God said in Matthew 16, Jesus said, I'm going to confirm my word with signs that follow. They that believe will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They'll cast out devils and speak in new tongues. If they drink any deadly thing. If they take a vaccine they're not sure of, God's going to protect. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on from there. Can I tell you something? When we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural world's going to break into the natural society and natural culture. Miracles are going to take place, and it's not going to be just by the name or the power of some big-name preacher. Bless them all. But God's going to use normal people. How many of you are somewhat normal? God's going to use you to cast out devils and heal the sick. There's going to be a supernatural expression of the kingdom of God. And how many think that there needs to be the kind of power that we are not only not fear the virus, but we can see people healed? Not just of the virus. Everything else seems to have disappeared because of COVID in the, you know, the CDC realm. But there are still people dying of cancer. There are still people sick of other things. God has put the power in you and I to release healing. To release the miracles of God will turn a nation. Do you remember Elijah stood before a compromised nation of Israel who had, who had fallen in uh, idolatry to Baal and Ashtoreth, led by the spirit of Ahab and Jezebel? I want to say this. I believe that America has now become an idolatrous nation, and we're following the spirit of Jezebel and Ahab in government, in church realm, in every realm, to follow and serve the gods of Baal and Ashtoreth, which if you study them, Baal worship included the sacrificing children, burning them on the altar. The greatest um, number of murders and deaths that happened last year in the world had nothing to do with a virus. It was the number of children born or, or killed before they could take a breath. And now in my state, Virginia, and some others, they can take a breath and still legally kill them. You see, our nation is serving Baal. Ashtoreth was a god of perversion. Our nation is now under the sway of Jezebel, Ahab, Baal, and Ashtoreth. But God raised up a prophet. His name was Elijah. And Elijah prayed for fire. Not a fire of judgment, but a fire of demonstration. Again, our prayer is not God judge America. Our, God, our prayer is God demonstrate who you are and turn our nation. Ezekiel prayed and there was a fire that came from heaven. There was a supernatural demonstration. I still believe there can be a supernatural demonstration that will turn the heart of our nation. One final thing with speaking in tongues, and I close with this slide. I heard a, a minister say this a few weeks ago, and this is not a theology because you can't prove this doctrinally, but it's a wondering. Do you remember when Adam and Eve were put in the garden? God said to them, I give you dominion. It's not dominion to rule over a people, it's dominion over creation to serve mankind. We're not trying to rule people, we're trying to love and serve people. But we have a dominion authority in the spirit. And we don't know what language Adam and Eve spoke in the garden, do we? Probably wasn't English, probably wasn't Spanish. But it was a heavenly language, would you agree? God gave them language, they didn't learn it. And the language they had was sufficient for their task of dominion. Whatever dominion authority they had, they expressed in that heavenly language. Well, the fall came, sin came. And you remember a story of the Tower of Babel? When man came together and they wanted to build a tower to reach to the heavens, to the very throne of God. And God said something that's confusing in some ways. He said, if we don't stop them, nothing they attempt will be impossible to them. There is power in unity, even if it's, even if it's demonic unity. And you know how God stopped mankind from building a tower to heaven? He confused their languages. He took away the heavenly language and gave us human language. 
So we no longer have the full capacity of dominion, authority in the language we speak. But something was restored on the day of Pentecost. A heavenly language. Now I'm not saying that the words we speak in tongues today are the same actual words that Adam and Eve spoke. What I am saying is there is a heavenly language when we pray in the Spirit. And that heavenly language has a power, I believe, a dominion authority. That means when I pray in the spirit, there's a dominion of heaven, the keys of the kingdom being released. I believe the church needs to learn how to pray with dominion authority. And I believe that comes as we pray in the spirit and in tongues. So, are we in the last days? Yep, we have been for 2,000 years, and we're closer today than we were yesterday. Are we in the last days because of all the 2020 happened that? I don't know. But what I do know is this. I'm going to live ready to meet Jesus at any second, at any moment. But I'm also going to live like there's 100 years and beyond because I'm going to raise up the next generation. I'm going to make a difference in culture. I'm not going to hide away waiting for an escape. I believe in the rapture. But the rapture is not an escape. It's a homegoing celebration. The Antichrist will rage. Satan will rage. The nations will rage, Psalm 2 says. But I'm arising as a son of the Almighty God through Jesus Christ to exercise his authority. Why? So the gospel of the kingdom of God will go through the nations of the world and then Jesus will come back. I want to pray and challenge you today to receive an empowering of the Holy Spirit. If you already speak in tongues, praise God. Let me challenge you to receive a fresh empowering, a fresh filling. And let me challenge and encourage you to begin to pray in the Spirit like never before. If you do not yet speak in tongues, if you're not yet baptized in the Holy Spirit, let me tell you something. You are not a second-class Christian. Do you hear me? You are a first-class child of God even if you don't yet speak in tongues. You know what? God is not a respecter of persons. The gift he has for one, he wants to give to all. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? To receive the Holy Spirit, we don't have to blow on you. We're not allowed to do that anymore anyway, are we? We don't have to lay hands on you. I'm not the giver. He is. And I want to pray today that God would give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The power of God to release the name of Jesus into culture around us. Stand with me if you would. Kim Shekai, I want you to come just stand right down here in the front. And what we want to do is we want to pray for an empowering of the Holy Spirit to come upon us in a fresh way, in a fresh dimension. Guys, I appreciate the, uh, the, 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 the luxury of time that you've given. We have a few more minutes together. Our, our children's workers have been faithful with the kids, but we don't want to keep them too long because how many of you know kids are a blessing, but they can get rowdy. But I also want us to pray that the word of God today will break forth into our lives of practicality. So I want you to lift your hands if you desire to with me. In fact, let me, let me pray and then I'm going to ask a couple questions. Holy God, we stand on the precipice, pastor said it, Lord, of a new day, a new way. Lord, you said on Isaiah, forget the former things, don't dwell in the past, I'm doing a new thing. God, it's not new from your word, it's not new from who you are, because you and your word stay constant. But Lord, sometimes it's a new thing in the way that we are used to, the ways that we've expressed and Lord, for too long, your church and our nation has been an audience. But God, make us an army. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, we pray that fear would be driven out. God, we pray that you would grab a hold of our hearts and bring us into that place of surrender and repentance. In the name of Jesus. And then, Lord, pour your spirit out upon us. 
that, Lord, we may receive the wind of God that will cause us to come together in unity, that we will set aside our differences of opinions. Lord, even when they're strong, sharp differences of opinion, may we set aside. Lord, it's not that we, we uh, quit fighting for what we believe is right, but, Lord, we will not base our unity on things other than Christ. Lord, breathe with your breath, and may we come alive as an army. May your fire fall upon us, and Lord, purge us and draw us into your heart of passion. And Lord, propel us into that place of heavenly destiny. And Lord, fill our mouths with the praise of God. Fill our mouths with the words of heaven. That Lord, as we pray, as we declare in the spirit, dominion from heaven would be released and your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, we thank you. I want you to look this way with me for just for a second. It's always an honor to address a group of people. And on Sunday morning in most places today, the majority have said yes to Christ. But sometimes there are people that come among us that either you've never said yes to Jesus or maybe somewhere along the way you've walked away. How many of you know that this last year has tested our faith? And maybe you feel that you failed that test. You feel like you're not surrendered to Christ. You've been so full. And I'm not saying fear is taking you away from, from being saved. That's not what I'm saying at all but you feel you're in a place of compromise where you're not fully surrendered to Christ. I'm not talking about we just have some issues, but our heart has turned away. So I want you with eyes up, I want you looking this way with me for a moment. You may not be perfect, but you know you're born again. Maybe you're having some struggles, but you know that you're a child of God. You know you're born again. You know you're on your way to heaven. If Jesus were to come now, you have no doubt you would go to be with him in eternity. So if that's you, you say, look, I may not be perfect. I may have some struggles, but I'm convinced that I'm right with God. I'm a child of God. Wave your hand at me. Praise God. Amen. You can put your hands down. Look, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot or embarrass anybody needlessly, but if you couldn't lift your hand just then, I want you to know something. That the same grace of God that brought me, I got saved when I was about five years old. The worst thing I'd ever done was probably steal an Oreo cookie. And can I tell you something? I was a sinner. I needed a Savior. Doesn't matter how good or bad you've been, it's all through Jesus. Bow your heads with me just for a moment. If you couldn't lift your hand just a moment ago, and you say, today... I want to make things right with God. I've never given my life to Christ or I'm backslidden. I've, I've walked away. I'm not sure I'm right with God. But today I want to surrender. Today I want to make things right with Jesus. If that's you with heads bowed, lift your hand up just quickly. I'm going to give that opportunity. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. Thank you. Anyone else? I want you to look this way with me. In fact, uh, I just you don't even have to look. Close your eyes. But I want us to say this prayer together. Please hear me. The words are not magic, but when you mean them with your heart, God hears, and a transaction takes place that's supernatural, where God puts in you a, a heart of flesh and takes out a heart of stone, where you go from serving yourself to serving God. You become a child of God, adopted into the family, born again, forgiven of your sin. So everyone say this out loud, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And you rose from the dead to give me eternal life. I confess that I have sinned and I need forgiveness. So I repent. I turn away from my old life. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me, Jesus. And because of your promise, I am now a child of God. I'm a new creation. Fill me with your spirit. And help me to live for you. Help me to glorify your name. 
Now, would you all lift your hands to Jesus, just everyone in the room with me. And I want us to pray for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. If you already have the prayer language of the Spirit, I want you to begin to pray in the Spirit with us. If you do not yet have that prayer language, I want you to open your mouth. And the Bible says that as you speak, God will put words in your mouth, words of the Spirit. So lift your hands. Lord Jesus, we pray that even as we're born again, even as you are empowering your church, even even as happened on the day of Pentecost and now is the promise of God for every believer. Holy Spirit of God, be poured out upon your people. Lord, raise up the church in our nation and throughout the world full of the power of the Holy Spirit that, Lord, your kingdom would come and be manifest. So, Lord, pour out your spirit. Open your mouths, if you would, and begin to worship him. God, we pray in a heavenly language that carries dominion authority. Lord, pour out your spirit. Let the breath of God come. Let the breath of God come. Let the breath of Ruach. Lord, let the spirit of God come and breathe and bring us out of our graves. Lord, breathe and bring us out of the graves of dead, uh, dead passion, dead destiny. God, resurrect our lives with purpose and passion to the Son of God and the Kingdom of God. Lord, let a baptism of fire be released. God, baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lord, cause us to fall in love with you all over again. Lord, open our hearts to see a manifestation and a revelation of how much Jesus loves us and we therefore love you because you first loved us. God, propel us. Lord, may 2021 be a year not of cowering in the corner out of fear, not just of trying to survive the coming days, but God, propel us into the place of glory and destiny, that your name would be made famous in all the earth, that your kingdom be manifest, that your power would be demonstrated, O oh God. Open your mouths one more time and pray in the Spirit. If you've not yet received, begin to speak now. Open your mouths and begin to speak the presence of God, the Word of God, the praises of God. And Lord, for Pastor Tim and Robin, God, for City Church, we pray that 2021 would be a, a year, Lord, of setting the pieces in place, Lord, for the victory. Um, church and pastors, here's one of the things I see. I keep seeing a chessboard, and I see the pieces being placed in, in order, moved around to be ready for a checkmate. Now, I'm not a chess player, but I understand enough about it to know this, that for, the, for a checkmate, Mate, which means a victory. The pieces have to be moved to be in a certain place. So when the time, when it's time for the final victory, everything is in place. And I feel the Lord is saying to you as a church, I'm going to shift things. It's not going to be just a shift of doing online or having mass. It's going to be a shift of roles. It's going to be a shift of understanding your positions and your places. God says, I'm going to strategically move some things around. And so do not get concerned. Do not get fearful when things move, when people move, when things shift. Because God says, I am shifting the pieces in you, my friends, you, my brothers and sisters. You are the pieces of God's chest uh, board here in this region. And God is shifting and moving. He's setting things up for the victory that is to come. So the Lord says, victory is yours, but things are being set up and positioned for that victory move. So the Lord says, prepare yourselves for shift, for change. Change that is of God. Hear this. 2021 is not the year to be forced to change by outside forces. It is the year to willingly change because of the move of God. Does that make sense? I want you to hear this. God is saying your biggest changes when pastor was talking about God's doing something new. The newest thing God's doing among you is not going to be forced from outside circumstances. 
It's going to be because you are responding to the Spirit of God. So, Lord, shift us. Shift our jobs. Shift our positions. Shift our titles. Shift the way we operate. Shift our giving. Shift our priorities. Shift even the ministries in the house. And set us up, Lord, for the days of victory that are just ahead. Father, we thank you. Kim Shikai. I had been seeing a vision for y'all, and what I saw was this. I saw there's been a buildup behind these big steel doors. It's like there's so much there, but it's like it's not coming out somehow. And I saw a suddenly happen with you guys, and I don't know when this is going to happen, but I saw a suddenly, and it was just like this one moment in time, all of a sudden those double doors, those double steel doors opened, and it was like this torrent, torrent of blessing started flowing out, torrent of blessing. And some of you have felt like you're blessings have been stopped up, that they've been behind a wall, and that you've not seen, you just see a little trickle coming out of the corner here or there, but nothing like you know is supposed to happen. But the Lord says this, believe for your suddenly. Your suddenly will happen, and it will open up the double doors, and you will see a torrent of blessing like you have never seen before. The Lord says, believe, believe, cry out, and watch if I will not open up that double door of blessing, and the torrent will pour out. Part of that has to do with what we were talking about earlier. The blessings God will run after you and tackle you. But hear this. God is blessing us so we can be a blessing. Let me tell you, one of the reasons much of our culture is crying out for socialism and for the government to take care of them is because the church isn't doing our job. God wants to bless you. And here's what I believe. God wants us to be the answer that people are looking to the government for. The church ought to be the answer. So God, shift us, bless us, so that we can be a blessing. Lord, releasing healing, releasing hope, releasing provision into our culture around us. Pastors and church, I saw you guys, and you're going into this dark room. And the best way I can explain it is every step that you took was like an earthquake. It was shaking the foundation of that room. And initially, the people in that room, they did not like that whatsoever. They didn't like that their foundation was being messed with, that their foundation was being shaken. But I saw as you didn't care what they thought, you just kept doing what the Lord was telling you guys to do. And every step you took made the ground shake more and more and more until suddenly a wall that had been there started to crack and a little bit of light started streaming in. And more and more of that began to crack until the room got so, so, so bright. And then all of these people that were once in darkness, these people, this place that was in such darkness, they finally saw the Lord because of your obedience to him. And I saw as they fell to their knees in repentance to the Lord. I don't know if you get what that's saying. God is going to release you onto the darkness of culture around you, and every step you take is going to release the earthquake of heaven. Does that make sense? And the very foundations of darkness are going to crumble and fall when you, the people of God, put your foot down. So I want you to prophetically put your foot down. God, we put our foot down on the neck of the enemy, on the head of the enemy. We put our foot down and say, every place we put our foot, you've given to us for the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, for Jacksonville, for our families, for our churches, Lord, for this region, God, for our nation, we put our foot down and say, God, there is authority in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the very foundations of hell shake and crumble, and may the light of God penetrate and shatter the darkness that is trying to creep upon our nation. So God, let your church arise and may the kingdom of God be released. Now, Lord, we seal the word and work of God. Lord, for those in need of physical healing in their bodies, if you need a healing touch in your body, would you lay hands on yourself on or near that place where you need healing? It might be for a family member as well. Jesus, by your stripes, we have been made whole. We declare not only is COVID-19, COVID-20, COVID-21, all the, all the names they're going to keep trying to give to variations and mutations. God, we will not live under the fear of the virus. God, it may be a real virus. 
It may be man-made. It may be natural from a bat. It may be demonic. God, we don't care about the source. We care about the solution. And you are the solution. But God, not just in this virus. Lord, there are people hurting, people sick, and so many other areas. We pray in Jesus' name, release the healing of God. God, may every cell of our bodies be made whole. God, we declare. Lord, I say from Mark 16. God, there might be some among us that take the vaccine, some that do not. And Lord, some are fearful about it changing DNA. God, I don't know all those things. What I say is this, nothing that it comes against us, nothing that is ingested, nothing that is released in our bodies will harm the people of God. And Lord, we pray that Lord, you would release your kingdom in our nation through your church. And Lord, it's for your glory and your honor. For Jesus, there is no other name above your name. At your name, every knee will bow and tongue confess. So Lord, we declare for the glory and the honor of the name of Jesus. Now Lord, teach us to pray in the spirit. Teach us to live in the spirit. Teach us to live in truth and not let deception come upon us. And God, may the greatest days of effectiveness Hear this. It may not be the biggest crowds always. It may not be the biggest offerings always. But the Lord seems to be stirring in my heart to pray that the greatest effectiveness of this body will be in this year and following. God, you will take care of the crowds. You'll take care of the finances. But God, we ask that this be the greatest year of effectiveness for our lives and the kingdom of God. And Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands with me and praise Jesus? Glory, we honor you. Guys, it's always, it's always, always a blessing and an honor to be with you all. Thank you, Pastor Tim. God bless you all. Pastor, you need to share and close out.